the Olivet Discourse is the passage of prophecy in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. These passages are popularly understood to be about Jesus' final coming in our future, about a great tribulation in our future, the rapture, and all of those kinds of things. It is a given that these things have not taken place yet, and so the post-millennial partial preterist understanding is nonsense. But it seems to me that the futuristic views of the Olivet Discourse have far more problems, and significant ones at that, than the preterist. For example, we're told repeatedly and in numerous ways throughout the New Testament that judgment was coming on the generation of Jesus' own day. And in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus explicitly says the people he was speaking to would witness whatever it was he was talking about. Jesus ends the bulk of this uh, teaching in the passage by saying, this is in verse 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And you can reference that with Mark 13.30 and Luke 21.32. This statement comes immediately after Jesus had just taught about the Great Tribulation, the coming of the Son of Man, the sun darkening, the stars falling out of the sky, the preaching of the gospel to the whole world, and saying things like, then the end will come in verse 14. So how could these things have been witnessed by that generation? How could these things have already happened? They clearly have not happened. And so because we bring a ton of assumptions to what these things mean, we change what Jesus says in verse 34 to mean something other than that generation he was speaking to. And it's possible to do that, um, but I'm unconvinced that that's how we should read this. I think that there is good and conclusive evidence to understand this passage to mean that those things that he was speaking of have already taken place. The preterist view takes verse 34 to literally mean that generation, that it means what it says, that it was the generation Jesus was speaking to who would witness the things he just described. Jesus is emphatic on this point. He says, assuredly, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. This is reinforced by what Jesus was saying earlier in Matthew 23, just the previous chapter. In that chapter, Jesus is trashing the religious leaders the whole time. And it ends with Jesus saying that they will be judged for killing the prophets and the wise men and the scribes sent to them by God. That the blood from Abel to Zechariah would be avenged on that generation. Jesus says to them, Therefore you are witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And then he says this again. It's an emphatic point. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Again, he is referencing this generation. Judgment's coming. The blood of the martyrs and the prophets from Abel to Zechariah will be avenged on them. He says that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. He directs the statement to those who have killed the prophets and will kill the prophets, which I take to mean the ministers of the gospel sent out in the apostolic age from 30 AD to 70 AD, to include the killing of the Messiah. Also, the word earth in Greek can be translated as land. It's either, it's either one. And I think land would be a better translation as it is a reference uh, to the prophets killed in the land of God's people at the time, killed in Palestine. There's a ton of significance tied to the land in the Old Testament, and I believe Jesus is bringing that forward here. And immediately after this, Jesus laments over Jerusalem. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then immediately after this, Jesus predicts the literal destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which the temple is a, a synecdoche of Jerusalem. 
So it, it's uh, a part, but it symbolizes the whole. And it symbolizes, I would say, a whole lot more than just the literal destruction. It's the passing away of the Judaic Aeon, the age of the Old Covenant. So let's read the beginning of the Olivet Discourse. This is Matthew 24. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So he's talking about the temple, and then they ask him about the sign of the coming and the end of the age. I take this to be connected. It's not switching to the end of the world. It's the end of their world. Then as he went out of the temple, this is from Mark 13, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall, be, uh, that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Now, some people take these to be separate questions. When's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem? And then the sign of these things being fulfilled is put in our future. But I view them all as the same. It's all talking about the same thing. And then in Luke, Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come, in which not one stone shall be left upon another, that shall not be thrown down. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? So in Matthew 23, Jesus just prophesied the judgment on that generation. And here he prophesies the judgment on the temple specifically. And if we could read between the lines a bit, we see that the disciples are possibly pushing back against Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 23. They're thinking, yeah, judgment might come. But at least we've got the temple of the Lord. Look at how beautiful it is. The glory of Jerusalem. It's almost an echo of the people in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah says, Do not trust in these lying words saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. I think the disciples possibly doing something similar. And yet Jesus dashes their hopes in the temple of the Lord, as understood as the Herodian temple of the first century in Jerusalem. There's a greater temple coming. That's the church. Jesus says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And sure enough, in 70 AD, 40 years later, that generation witnessed the temple and Jerusalem being destroyed. The preterist interpretation most naturally lets the context tell us what the Olivet Discourse is about. Jesus points to the temple and says, this is going to be destroyed. His disciples ask him, well, when and how is it going to be destroyed? And the rest of the discourse is Jesus answering those questions. Whenever the disciples ask about the sign of Jesus' Jesus' coming and the end of the age, we turn those questions into a question about the end of all things, about the final judgment. But there's nothing in the passage to indicate this. It's the opposite. His disciples are asking, when will these things be? When will the destruction of of Jerusalem be? And then connecting that to terms like the coming of the Son of Man, the end of the age. So the context is telling us what these words mean. Postmillennialists are accused of bringing things to the text that aren't there, but to me it seems like futurists are the ones bringing things that aren't there. The text is saying this generation, this generation, this generation. The text is saying this is about Jerusalem, this is about the temple. It's all right there. It's all screaming first century fulfillment in context. Now if Jerusalem wasn't destroyed, Within that generation in history, uh, the futurist interpretations might have some more weight, but I think the clear context and then the actual historical fulfillment really, I think, make it an uphill battle for a futurist view of these things. All right, let's move on to the cosmic deconstruction language. Jesus then goes on to describe the destruction of Jerusalem using the same decreational, cosmically disruptive, apocalyptic language from the prophets of the Old Testament. Cosmic deconstruction is the language of the prophets. 
It's not immediately apparent to us that Jesus is doing this because we live in a Christian culture which is Old Testament illiterate. We haven't successfully soaked our minds in the Old Testament language. We don't know our Old Testaments. We don't read our Old Testaments. We have New Testament pocket Bibles. And thank God for those. Many people have been saved reading a Gideon uh, pocket New Testament. But it is kind of a strange thing because it suggests that the Old Testament is superfluous. It's an unnecessary thing. Imagine the last chapter of Moby Dick as a pocket-sized book. Or imagine reading the last chapter of Les Miserables. It might really be moving and edifying, but there's a whole story and build-up to that last chapter. You're not going to understand everything fully. The Bible is the same way. We can't just teleport into the New Testament and expect to fully grasp everything that's going on. All of Scripture is God-breathed. It is one coherent story with one God speaking through his servants. And the New Testament is what everything in the Old Testament was anticipating, building up to. The New Testament is inextricably connected to the Old. And the more we understand the Old, the better we can understand the New and vice versa. Recognizing the prophetic language Jesus uses in the Olivet Discourse is one example of this. It would eliminate, I think, a lot of problems here. The post-mill preterist interpretation insists strongly on letting Scripture interpret Scripture. So, let us proceed by letting the scriptures do that for us. So, let's, we'll focus on verse 29 in Matthew 24, and then there's uh, similar language in the other parallel passages. Jesus says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You can compare this to Isaiah. Isaiah says, the oracle, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amaz uh, saw. That's Isaiah 13.1. He then goes on to say, for the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. That's just a few verses later. Similar language that Jesus is using. And we are explicitly told that this prophecy in Isaiah is about Babylon, just like Jesus tells us his prophecy is about Jerusalem. And Babylon is destroyed by the Assyrians shortly after Isaiah's pro prophecy in 689 BC by Sennacherib and then 539 BC by Cyrus the Mede, the Persians. Just as Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD by Titus. Isaiah says, in uh, verse uh, chapter 34, all the hosts of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction. So Edom is literally destroyed by Babylon in the early and late 6th century BC. Decreational, cosmically disruptive, apocalyptic language associated with specific events in history, explicitly connected to them in the text, just like the Olivet Discourse. Ezekiel says, In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him. So we are explicitly told that this is about Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He goes on to say, when I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord. And Egypt is literally destroyed by Babylon in 605 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. Decreational, cosmically disruptive, apocalyptic language associated with specific events in history, explicitly connected to them in the text, just like the Olivet Discourse. Amos prophesies mostly against northern Israel throughout his book in the time of the kings prior to their uh, destruction, and he uses the same kind of language. On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. And the northern Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Decreational, cosmically disruptive, apocalyptic language associated with specific events in history, explicitly connected to them in the text, just like the Olivet Discourse. And Joel uses the same language. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the coming and great and awesome day of the Lord. And Peter applies this prophecy to the time of Pentecost, Acts 2, 17 through 21. 
It's possible for the warnings of uh, destruction to be of Israel and Judah prior to their destruction by Assyria and Babylon, like most of the other prophets. Could be a reference to the wars of the intertestamental period. Could be a prophecy of judgments in our, our future, perhaps even the final judgment. It could be all of these things. But what the Bible shows us explicitly is that this is about Pentecost. And I would argue from what we have read above, it's about the time from Pentecost to Holocaust, as David Chilton would put it, or the time from Pentecost to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. It's kind of this overlapping period. It's the destruction of the old covenant era and the construction of the new covenant kingdom era, the messianic reign of Christ. The point is, Joel is using the same decreational, cosmically disruptive, apocalyptic language, and then Peter applies this language to the time of Pentecost, calling it the last days. He is applying this cosmically deconstructive language to that generation. He's saying, you're seeing this fulfilled here, and this is in harmony with everything we have gone over so far. The point is, Jesus uses the same apocalyptic language the Old Testament prophets used when describing the destruction of cities and nations in their immediate future and our past. There's imminent destruction coming, and apocalyptic, cosmically deconstructive language is used. That's what Jesus is doing. And it's not eisegesis to see Jesus doing the same thing with Jerusalem. This is just basic hermeneutical methods applied. Scripture interpreting scripture, paying attention to the context, letting it tell us what it's in reference to rather than us telling it what, it, what it's in reference to. So in conclusion and to review, Jesus says the generation of Jews he was speaking to was going to be punished for the blood of the prophets they killed from Abel to Zechariah and also the martyrs of the church and ultimately the crucifixion of Christ. He goes on to explicitly tell us that the temple was going to be destroyed. He answers the disciples' questions about the sign of his coming and the end of the age with what is the bulk of the Olivet Discourse. In this passage, he uses cosmic deconstruction language, which is the language of prophets, when they speak about the imminent destruction of specific cities and nations. Jesus is doing precisely this. He says this generation is going to see these things. The context of the Olivet Discourse makes these prophecies about Jerusalem and the generation that was alive at the time. Using the scriptures to interpret the prophetic language of Jesus reinforces this point. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was the vindication of Christ in time in history. That his prophecies came true and with a myriad of other things confirmed his word and who he was, the Christ. God vindicates his holy ones. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Psalm 135. And that is what the Olivet Discourse is about. We're just getting started here. I'm sure there's more questions about this passage. And we'll examine more of the passage in future podcasts. But for now, have a great day. And uh, we'll see you later. Bye.